very interesting um, <clears throat> speeches there, presentations in terms of the evolving world that we live in, whether that's from a conflict perspective in terms of human migration or from a climate change perspective, um, from the Madeira example, or even from the, um, you know, the, 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 the need for local epidata from Lisa's presentation and the outbreak management from uh, the BTV Public Health England perspective. I just wanted to start off by asking a question, really, that, and it's not every day that we end up getting government representatives in terms of the ministries of health. So we've got Saudi Arabia at the end and we've got Portugal here. So I just wanted to ask, a lot of the issues that you've, you've raised in terms of as an example, lack of sanitation, lack of healthcare infrastructure, brought on about by conflict or brought on by, um, you know, the changing world that we live in. Um, how how much involvement can the sovereign state have? What can you do? And from your opinion, what would you know? What could you do to alleviate some of those issues? Uh, in in case of, uh, for example, in the, in the conflict is it. In, in case of like in a peace, so uh, always the, 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 there is like a integration work. So, for example, if if there is like a problem in, in, in sanitation or sewage, so this is definitely will have impact on, on the on the diseases. So, uh, in, in if we are looking, for example, in some some uh, like a lack of, of water, uh, and, and for example in, in in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, that's actually give consequence in. To, to develop uh, dinghy, uh, so this actually like a kind of uh, consequences. But always with the integration between the all sectors, so like a municipality, uh, health, and uh, and agriculture. This actually co the combination work together. So this is actually give you a very good uh, impact on, on health. Uh, but in case of like in, in Syria or in, in the conflict. Uh, it would be hard to, to, to resolve the sewage systems because it's, it's collapsed. But in, in, uh, we could actually uh, do like a health impact assessment prior to do any like a camps or, or to even, even for, for, for soldiers who deploy in an in, in area where it's, the, it's endemic uh, diseases. So uh, we could actually have a health impact assessment to avoid this kind of issues. Ana Clara? At Madeira, it's a little bit different. Our problem, it's not a problem uh, related with poor sanitation or uh, things like that. But I agree, the most important thing, it's the, the, the intersectorial coordination. And um, the, um, we did more than that. We have a coordination, intersectorial coordination, that is, a legal, that is in a legal support. And the, the government says, by law, who do, who are who do what who pay uh, this is the most difficult thing who pay because nobody has money but <laughs> that it's but it's clear for us for example we have the regional level the local level and we have including for example the education level for the education level we have a, 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 a project that is mandatory for whole schools, who pays that? Pay the health, for example. But f if you need to do some environmental sanitation, who do? Who does, the, who does the, this? The municipality. Who pays? Municipality. You should have these instructions and totally clear, transparent, and you should have a special budget that it's very important, but more than that, you should have the, 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 the focal point identified, and for us, the way was the legal support included. Okay. I mean, turning that question around, um, you're saying more in intersectorial collaboration, different departments and governments working toward the common goal. Looking at it from a different perspective, and picking up something like that you mentioned, Lisa, in terms of the local epi data that you're generating from your study at village level, right? Would there be more, and I'm asking this for a reason, that some of the issues you highlight will be about mapping, and we know uh, from a consensus position that Aegis Egypti mapping in Africa is an absolute nightmare. Nobody wants to fund it at the moment, right? 
or there's a lack of funding in that area. What I wanted to ask you is that, is this the age of citizen science? How much can we lean on the population of people affected and what would be the role of government in that in terms of behaviour change or getting them to engage for disease reporting? What can governments do? I'd like to get your position on that, Lisa. I think the opportunities for collaboration with citizens is very strong. Uh, for example, you may have community health workers that work very, very closely with communities, but they may just have one role, whether that's for uh, vaccinating infants or whether that's for distributing drugs for an MDA or distributing bed nets. But those individuals have such a keen sense of what the problems are in that community we would need to be careful to not overburden them by identifying them as the most logical uh, point of contact. But I think building up from within and um, with the appropriate incentives, I think that communities would be very keen to do a lot of their own self-reporting and, uh, and uh, you know, metrics, not just for NTDs, but other measures of health. I was, I was going to ask that same question to, to you, Marion, as well, in terms of the vaccination program you mentioned for BTB was largely voluntary, but you said that there's an <coughs> outlook in terms of risk perceived in terms of lack of uptake or you know, involvement in that program. What would be, would there, would there be an education platform that the authorities could to use to facilitate that or awareness or? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think for the affected farms in the southeast, um, it's still in living memory. Um, so they, so at, in actual fact, the areas that are likely to be most affected, which is the southeast, um, hopefully they would um, have good vaccination uptake because they would be the same farmers that were affected last time. Um, whether it then continue, if, if the spread was more, you know, progressive across the UK. Um, I'm really not sure um, how how receptive people would be. I mean, you can't force people to pay for a vaccine, um, and it's not going to be funded by the government. So, um, in terms of bringing the barriers down, it would appear that collaboration and partnership are no longer, you know, terms of rhetoric, but they are something that that needs to happen now in terms of the evolving world we're living in. Just look at the migration crisis as an example. What you know, you're here today. I mean, would there be any kind of calls for partnerships out there now, in terms of from where you are now? Uh, you mean in, the, in the migration setting? Yeah, in a migration setting. Um, uh, actually, the in the, the mig in uh, for migration is uh, uh, for 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 uh, uh, today. Just to give example, flesh analysis, uh, and they ha they actually the, there is still polio and a measles uh, problem in, uh, among refugees, but leishmaniasis is, is a, a main issue actually with, with refugees. So um, uh, they actually require to, to, for, for, to more uh, technical sub, uh, ad, uh, advice uh, from like the WHO uh, because it's still, it, um, it's the, uh, still and, uh, they underestimate uh, the problem. Uh, and, uh, and uh, still, there is no like call for 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 a partnership, for 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 funding, for for uh, technical support is, uh, in in this area. Yeah. So, okay, that's interesting. I mean, I'd throw any questions out from the audience to the panel as well. So please feel free to. Um, are, there, are there any questions? Gi Giuseppina. Uh, Um, you mentioned different strategies that you used, but from your discussion, it looked like you used one and then another one. Did you have a time point when you used all of them at once, and what was the results if you did? We, we used once at a time because we are uh, looking for one cost effective that could be scaled for all region. We used that one, that means that we can address the problem into the domestic containers, as I said, for example. We need to have evidence and guidance to have one to scale. 
Of course, that we had history to use adulticides and uh, uh, larvicides 2006, 2007, 2008. We did four campaigns using chemical control, and the result was zero. And we spent a half of million of euros to do these four years into campaigns using chemical. Uh, larvicides, of course, we, w was BTI. Um, now we are doing this special because we don't know enough about our mosquito population. We study it into the, the field of genetical mutations. We have information about now we are convinced that our mosquitoes at Poldomar are different than the mosquitoes at Funchal. This is the two populations. And we spend a, a, a lot of time to understand everything that we, uh, um, that we feel that it's very important to have a scale uh, control measure for whole island in, in this kind of things. Of course, that we still having the social control we have all several campaigns, education campaigns during all year. We have, as I said, a mandatory program at schools. We have a mandatory program at the public institutes, organization. They should clean, they should eliminate breeding sites, they should report to us. We have a special program for ports and airports, not just entomological surveillance, but information including to all organization um, to maintain the space uh, clean and uh, eliminating uh, the breeding sites. The, the, I can, uh, maybe I should say that our more important um, action is into the breeding site reduction. But it's at the all year and at level organizational. For now we are trying to implement that study to evaluate how people could accept, for example, uh, mosquitoes modified genetically. Um, but this two essays with piperoxifen and BTI is to have information, evidence to escape to scale for whole region or whole region with, of course, uh, presence of mosquitoes. That means it's uh, Funchal, Camera de Lobos, and Santa Cruz to use in a, a way, uh, uh, a large way. Um, another question, please, from the floor. Um, the incidence of cases of leishmaniasis before the, the conflict and, and after, was it possible for you to get a, a picture of um, how comprehensive the before data was? I mean, were, was leishmaniasis, was it notifiable in all of, the, all of the areas or was it notifiable in some and not in others? Was it, could you get a picture of how good the, the before data is? Uh, and, and actually in the most of uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, we based on uh, passive case detection, so the passive surveillance. So uh, the, the cases which is uh, I showed here, so represent about 30% to, to 33% of, of the total cases, of the real total cases. So, in, in, for example, in, 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 uh, in Lebanon, for example, is we, uh, the, the reporting cases was only two cases, but in in uh, uh, in one year, so then if the following year is with with migration is is increased into thousand three thirty three cases, and this is just for for reporting, report reported cases. So there will be maybe double or more, even more double because not all the patient coming to the to the to the clinic to to uh, to, to to treat and uh, and. Uh, you, you will miss about two thirds of the of two thirds of, of the cases, uh, and uh, there is no active surveillance. So, actually, the cases is 
uh, here is represented to one third, not more than one third, and uh, according to the to 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 our, to our knowledge in, in Middle East. So, in your opinion, there's probably more. Is it more underreporting now than there was before? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, if we in in the peace, so will be one third. In, in the war, definitely will be more than. So, maybe the reporting will be one in ten or some or even less. Mm, okay. Thank you. Uh, a question about the blue time. Why is there going to be no stockpiling of vaccine this time around when there was last time? Um, because there's no money. I think, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but I think because they, like, there's no kind of guarantee that it will reach the UK, so why would you fork out if you don't necessarily have to? Yeah. I should share that way, this way um, because it's a, an opportunity to share that. Maybe we are here. This is um, a special community of knowledge and expertise. Maybe we need to work more truth boundaries. For example, I know maybe in the Middle West there are organizations that are responsible for all countries. I'm going to give you an example. At Macaronesia geographical region, that means Azores, Madeira and Canarias, we do several projects in, uh, um, in all together. We use for that, now we are preparing one, we use for that, that for uh, um, proposals at the uh, European funds. We worked since 2009 till now with the European funds, for example, in the communication and in the network uh, etymological surveys. Now, we are preparing another one that includes Senegal, Mauritania, and Cape Verde. That means Madeira, for example, that has the knowledge. Um, Canarias that have more tourists, unfortunately, <laughs> than, than us. Um, and Azores that need to learn about that for important international ports because all ships that came from Africa to United States pass through Azores. We are preparing a, a, a big project, a mega project, that we are going to help in 30% 30, 30 these three countries. Senegal and Mauritania, because it's a, a outbreak of dengue, and Cape Verde with a outbreak of Zika. Maybe this is the way for the future. We should share. If one, if there are funding, we should prepare to to have that um, safe and secure plans to do and good intervention, but helping each other. This is a one important example for us because we are uh, uh, I don't know if you if you know about this but Masuras Madeira Madeira and Canary Island are two million and a half people but with tourists we are almost 15 million this is a very important region and we should work into this uh, the, this project all together other questions from the floor? Oh, I see lunch is taking its toll. Um, so just building on that, and can, yeah, sorry, I'd like to just comment and, and, uh, uh, and hear a comment. <laughs> uh, uh, we have the same, same thing actually in, in Red Sea. Red Sea, there is a, uh, in, the, in the east part, uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and west part is Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea, Djibouti. Um, the dengue was uh, eradicated from, from G Egypt in the 30s, in 1930s, and back again to the Red Sea in Jeddah. And f f with, with, a, with a movement of, of uh, the trade between, between the country and the port, it spread again to Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, and Yemen, so it spread from Jeddah. 
the main boat and with, with pilgrimage and movement. So this is another, another consequence and, and should all the countries is aware about, about the, this kind of things. So uh, very important actually to, to work together all the countries without, without just boundaries. So not just a problem with one country. If it's a problem with one country, it's a problem all the all neighboring countries. So, so the sharing of data, data yeah. with no boundaries. Yeah. Well, that's probably a question to ask uh, Rahman from the WHO. I don't know if he's being interviewed next door. Or is there kind of some kind of supranational, do you envisage some kind of supranational body for data, you know, storage, you know, a, a repository, somewhere to put all these various data strains? You've heard earlier, um, from the Break Dengue um, initiative, that even diagnostics, point of care, can be integrated into their system in terms of taking data streams in. So, is there a case for a supranational you know, agency? Or yeah, yeah, I think it sh should be something like that. So yeah, of course. Yeah, to establish that. Yeah. Pro probably easier done than said. <laughs> uh, easier said than done, rather. But um, <clears throat> um, questions. Well, I, I was just wondering, kind of turning to the future, you've all come with a quite different set of challenges and shifts in boundaries. And I was just wondering from the panel, what would you see as a positive next step, each in your own kind of areas of focus? in terms of vector control, in terms of kind of harnessing in um, either uh, disease or the spread of uh, vectors? For me, a positive next step is having identified the eagerness for, say, malaria control programs to really coordinate and collaborate with NTD programs. Now, um, the desire is there, but what we don't really have is the platform for that collaboration. So for example, we have a project in Ghana, and both parties, uh, you know, their offices are on the same property, um, but they really don't share any of the data. They visit the same communities, they distribute interventions in the same communities, but there really is no collaboration or coordination. But there is an eagerness there, and I think looking forward, uh, what I've heard today is there are platforms that can assist with that type of collaboration, and we can help to harness that, you know, the wealth of, of resources that we have uh, and the willingness is there. Um, so we can, I think, work together towards common endpoints. I'd like someone to ask, what do you envisage the future role of the NGO to be in that data setting? Me. Yeah, I'll ask, I'll ask you, Lisa, because you mentioned local epidata, village. Yeah, you know, local. I think the development of tools that really meet the needs of control programs is, is what we heard about from Mike and what his group is working on. But I think we need the expertise to develop those, those tools that, uh, again, um, not what we think needs to be collected and how it needs to be reported and presented, but you know, that, that, that comes from the individuals that are currently managing that data. And I also think that some guidance on how, how best we work together, I think that there are very specific funding streams which may interfere with collaboration and coordination. Uh, and it would be great if we could look at how just um, how those systems are currently set up and how that's a, an impediment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, again, questions from the floor? It's like being in an auction when someone scratches <laughs> the uh, sold to the highest bidder. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I won't, uh, but I've got a question. So you, you've mentioned kind of the challenges of kind of conflict and migration and kind of neglected like tropical diseases. What do you think the challenges of global warming and that kind of climate change are? Uh, for me, yeah. For anyone. <laughs> for, for actually, and, uh, my focus more in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the conflict and, and migration. But uh, I did uh, work in, in the, the correlation between uh, the climate uh, and, uh, and uh, the impact on, on Kutam uh, There is like a significant correlation between the, the increasing and decreasing of the temperature 
in the in, in, on the on the Ishma analysis and Qatar's Ishma analysis uh, in some region of Saudi Arabia. So, um, uh, but for for other other uh, diseases, actually, I, I I have no idea about that. How about from a dengue perspective? Of course, the climate change is a problem. Ramadan, for example. Maybe we are suffering now the effects of climate change. That region of planet, um, since we have resist resisted, um, are a, a, a problem with the high temperature, much more uh, warm and less humidity, more dry. <coughs> that means, for example, for us at the, lab, at the municipality of Funchal, we did the two weeks ago, a um, workshop to implement a plan that means that we should be prepared and the, to the climate change. This is, a, uh, Portugal has, an, uh, at this moment, um, half of um, the municipalities are involved in the big project, a national level program. That means sh every municipality should have a plan to address the consequences of climate change. That includes this one, entomological data, epidemiological data, and communication plans. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you, you we talked a lot about the broader public sector you know, in, in this whole thing, and you mentioned funding earlier as well. Um, how about the private sector? What would be your messages for the private sector in terms of their involvement, or current level of engagement, you mentioned MDA models earlier, we've got a donation of drug, and even there, you've obviously seen those change in your own work. Um, what would be the future role? What more can the private sector do? Or, if, or if you like this, let's take one segment, right? let's take diagnostics as an example. What can private sector companies in diagnostics do to help? Whether that's, <laughs> whether, whether, whether that's at Marion at the BTV in their health settings or, you know, I, well, or I'll just speak to diagnostics. Yeah. Um, diagnostics for filariasis, uh, diagnosing filariasis is difficult on a community level because uh, we, it, it's just not feasible to take fingerprint blood samples of the entire population and it's, it's quite costly. There's no treatment seeking behavior. So we need to think of alternative approaches to monitoring disease, and maybe that means looking into the vector uh, in, in employing xenomonitoring. So I think that for a lot of the diseases where we have elimination targets set, set, we cannot measure for zero prevalence in the human population, but looking at um, new approaches to say how we pool samples of insects, uh, how we do multiplex testing, because a mosquito, if it's biting a person, even if it's only a vector for malaria, it's going to pick up any other blood-borne pathogens as well. So thinking about how we can use existing collection techniques, maybe for one disease, to help uh, surveillance for multiple diseases. And I think that, th that that's an area where we need um, further development. From the private sector, OK, fantastic. In, in your opinion, Marion? Um, I think the, um, well, I was going to sort of mention vector control in the industry and sort of private enterprises have pretty much been leading the way recently with um, vector control, and so that's been really good. Um, but in terms of um, things like vaccines as well, um, that, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are involved with that, but in terms of diagnostics, I think, um, so at Herbert we have the blue, t uh, blue tongue reference laboratory, and so we do all the kind of uh, testing for the EU there, um, so that's pretty well established. Okay. Okay. And Clara? We have a, a good experience with the private sector. For example, the, um, the, uh, the uh, enterprises uh, in the hotels for us, they support our communication plans, for right. example. They are very important too in the, um, this experience with the vector control essays. For example, in this project that we are now preparing, uh, we have a partner that is an enterprise from uh, Barcelona, for example, that are going to collaborate with us using the impregnated um, painting. The paint, it? yeah. Paint. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, to use in containers to collect water, for example. 
that is our, uh, uh, an effect of uh, uh, insecticide. Fantastic. Good. So there's some, some incentives. few experience, yeah. but they should be involved. Mm -hmm. okay. Wally, from your point of view, I know you're setting up the Vector Born Disease Unit and the MENA Hub. So from your point of view, what could the private sector do? Um, for pri private sector, for example, in Saudi Arabia is, uh, is focusing more uh, with, our, with, uh, with, with our work in Minister of Health in, uh, on the health education. So. Um, uh, and they are funding the, the project for health education, but currently for, for the disease require more like dinghy. Uh, so all the campaign for uh, health education is, is based on, on uh, private sectors. So uh, with actually so the governmental fund as well. So, um, but still uh, in Saudi Arabia, the private sector is, is require more to, to, to gather them to, to this kind of, of, of yeah. To build the yeah. economic case. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, fascinating. Uh, I think there's a question at the, the back. Thank you, I'm Lee Haynes from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. This is a question for all four of you panelists because you all study very different diseases. And with the focus of Zika in the news, and everyone saying Zika is fantastic because it's putting a spotlight on vector-borne diseases, I wonder if you have the same perspective that it is so fantastic in the sense of exposure, or is it taking away from your own research and focus and possibly future funding? It's a big question. Zika, Zika, Zika. <laughs> and its impact. <laughs> um, and if uh, we have experience in, in Saudi Arabia uh, two weeks ago. Um, there was actually like a, um, a small fund for, for, for uh, controlling dinghy. And a uh, consequence actually of, of Zika and, and the media, so spreading the Zika, and, uh, there was a, a big uh, uh, meeting between uh, the, the main three ministers, health and Agriculture and, and municipalities in Saudi Arabia, and uh, they have a big project now to control dinghy. So it's good actually has, has good actually effect on on to to combat dinghy, and we uh, they use Zika as a, as a as a like a, uh, to uh, advertise for for controlling dinghy. Uh, dinghy. <laughs> dinghy. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, of course, I agree with this. For us, at the coordination, Zika is a vector-borne disease point. We should prevent point. To involve the community, because it affects mothers and child and child or children, it's easy to move to mobilize people for this uh, um, disease more than dengue or more di than chikungunya. Chikungunya, it's the last because the name is very difficult. <laughs> not journalists, not politicians, they don't know what is ch chikungunya. Maybe the, the, usually they think this is a strange thing that, that doesn't happen in Europe. Zika, for us, had the, 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 the benefits uh, from the information about the defects on children and mothers. And for example, Cape Verde is uh, with a, a outbreak that at the moment is 7,000 cases, probable cases of sick. And they noticed one, just one case of microcephaly. And the, the thing changed. Till now, 7,000 uh, um, probable cases. Okay. But one microcephaly, oh my god, this is the effect for the, the, the government. Um, I think that animal diseases are always sort of going to pale into significance next to human diseases in terms of how much people are willing to fund a response. Um, so I agree that Zika has kind of um, brought into the fore um, vector-borne diseases, particularly mosquito-borne, um, but I'm not sure 
that that's really really going to help with <laughs> things like blue tongue. Um, for example, if it was a Zika virus that was causing a human, you know, basically if the BTV8 in central France was Zika, I think things would be a little different. <laughs> okay. um, any more questions from the floor? I just was going to add to that that um, I've had parents on the school playground ask me about 80s mosquitoes, and I, I, I think that that's a great sign that the community is paying attention to vector-borne diseases. It's unfortunate that it, it, it takes an outbreak like this to do that. I hope it doesn't go away. But I think that the, um, the current interest that we see for vector-borne diseases, the impacts of that will undoubtedly affect much more than just Zika transmission, and, and we're grateful for that. That's great stuff. I suppose the question is how to harness that momentum and keep it moving um, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the interest and the awareness that's being generated in that. But are there any more questions from the floor? If not, then I think I'm being pointed at for the time that we can break for coffee. I think that's a coffee break. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for coming.